Hello, uh, welcome to this month's uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Michael Kramer and I am presenting on behalf of Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. I am the uh, Calibration Inspection Program Manager at PJLA. Uh, and um, as you can see, today's topic, we're going to uh, look at Section 5.0 of uh, 17025-2017, which are the uh, new structural requirements of the standard. Oh, bear with me. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, here's my introductory page. Um, as always, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, will be available um, shortly after the conclusion of today's session. So uh, if you want to go back and re-listen or if uh, perhaps a colleague may have uh, uh, missed it and want to go back and uh, or, um, listen to the recording, by all means, uh, add a feature to our webinar tab is uh, you may uh, just uh, perhaps would like to have the slides from today's presentation. Okay, now, uh, you, you do not have to uh, email me anymore um, to request this. You can go directly to our website and you'll see under the webinar tab where you can uh, actually retrieve the slides, um, not just this one, but the, the a vast array of uh, the presentations we've been putting together uh, in the, since uh, the 2017 standard has been uh, introduced. Uh, questions. As always, uh, you should have a question box there on your screen. Please keep questions um, in regards to today's topic. Um, if something, a uh, question comes to mind, uh, feel free to type it in here into the box. And at the conclusion of the webinar, we'll go and uh, review the questions and uh, try to answer as many as I can to the best of my ability. So section 5.0 structural requirements. Um, uh, and uh, as far as looking at the uh, synopsis of uh, overall changes between the 2005 and 2017 um, standard, um, it's been restructures that you'll see. Uh, one, a couple terms you don't see in the 2017 standard. However, their functions are still there is the term uh, quality manager. And we'll, we'll see that uh, you still have to have uh, personnel responsible for doing uh, various tasks. It's typically associated with um, a quality manager. Also the term technical manager, um, very specific, descriptive in the 2005. You had to have uh, identify a person as quality technical manager. Um, and you uh, need to actually define their responsibilities within a quality manual. So you won't see either of those terms mentioned. We will look at uh, how it is structured and uh, what individual does, excuse me, what individual uh, needs to be um, pinpointed um, within the requirements of the 2017 standard. Hence, if you are still using a quality and technical ma uh, manager, uh, don't uh, um, feel that uh, those terms will be obsolete. Uh, they can still be used, can still be used to uh, um, effectively manage a lab and still meet the requirements of the 2017. However, it's no longer a specific requirement. Deputies, uh, maybe a good idea to always have someone uh, um, uh, in the wings uh, to act, say, on, in behalf of the quality or technical manager in their absence. However, the 2017, um, it's no longer a requirement to have deputies for key positions. Uh, another change, uh, uh, the laboratory is obliged to write down the range of activities. And that does not include those activities that have been permanently subcontracted. So in other words, the lab has to maintain the capabilities, of course, in order to be accredited, uh, those, uh, they will be uh, 
uh, verified during the course of the assessment. Um, permanently subcontracting would be those things at the lab. It is just uh, contracting out on a permanent basis. Okay, so there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of things that are the same in the 2005, 2007 versus 2017. One thing, and typically at the top of the checklist in my uh, 2005 work, 2005 workbook was, is the lab a legal um, entity? So uh, that has not changed. Uh, there has been a note added to the 2017 standard that specifies uh, government laboratories. Um, that's deemed to be a legal entity on the basis of its government status. So a legal entity typically, uh, here's a definition, can be anything, association, corporation, partnership, proprietorship, trust, or individual that has legal standing in the eyes of the law. A legal entity has legal capabilities to enter into agreements and contracts, assume obligations, incur and pay debts. Sue would be sued in its own right and to be held responsible for its actions. Okay, typically straightforward there, typically with an initial assessment, typically like to, as an assessor, uh, would like to see some sort of objective evidence. Um, don't want to assume anything that the organization is indeed a legal entity, perhaps a business license, something to that effect. Okay, so here's the, uh, I was mentioned uh, initially that the standard does specify that uh, at least one specific uh, person needs to be identified and it's specified right here into 5-2 that the laboratory shall identify management that has overall responsibility lab of the laboratory. Again, uh, not specific in identifying quality and technical um, manager, even though their functions are still included. And it's not necessarily, uh, um, uh, not necessarily to have deputies again for key positions. So with this uh, individual that has overall responsibility in the laboratory, typically your uh, old um, uh, standard 2005 technical manager would be typically an individual that has day to day operations uh, under their wings uh, and uh, the individual that's assuring that the laboratory on a constant basis is uh, operating um, in conjunction with laboratories procedures protocol the requirements of the standard. Uh, so as I stated before, you can still utilize the technical manager technical manager could still be identified as this individual however that term is uh, no longer required however it still could be used this is a, a requirement here when I was putting this webinar together I sort of was thinking about about this and what I was making is an assumption and I actually threw it out there to some colleagues um, the laboratory shall define and document the range of laboratory activities for which it conforms with it, this document. The laboratory shall only claim conformity with this document for this range of laboratory activities, which excludes externally provided laboratory activities on an ongoing basis. Again, that last externally provided uh, um, activities are subcontracting, which um, are uh, typically if it's on a permanent basis would typically be things that the, is out of the lab's capabilities anyway. So when I thought about uh, this, and I've always assumed this, uh, that uh, looking at these requirements, it sounds a lot like a scope of accreditation. So there's a sample of um, excerpt out of one of our scopes. So pretty much uh, as far as what the lab, as far as compliance and those activities, um, they're uh, specified right there within the scope of the accreditation. So we accredit a lab to the 2017 standard pretty much spells out. So like I said, I sort of uh, kicked it out there to some colleagues, uh, had several come back that felt that the um, scope of accreditation uh, uh, should be sufficient documentation for compliance and, uh, with that particular clause in 5.2. 
uh, was actually brought out, uh, have a million here. It may be important to communicate different levels of service for items identified on the scope. Uh, there should be evidence that provide confidence to customers clearly aware of the options. And one example that comes to mind in thinking about this with a calibration. And even recall when I was on the um, other side of the table managing a calibration lab, when, when uh, you send artifacts out to be calibrated, uh, there's several choices. Um, uh, anything from, uh, say, these are examples of a NIST 17025 accredited calibration. Uh, another choice could be a NIST traceable calibration. A uh, third choice could be a certificate of accuracy. So um, typically, um, an organization should uh, specify clearly what the differences would be. By far, nothing new here. Laboratories activities shall be carried out in a way as to meet the requirements of this document. This document being the standard. The laboratory's customers. There's there are several um, uh, references to meeting customer requirements within the standard. Regulatory authorities um, and organ organizations providing recognition. So one first thing that comes to mind, of course, would be the uh, uh, accrediting body, uh, um, Barry Johnson, for example, and of course we have policies, PL1, PL2, 3, we have SOPs at the lab or SOAR in, in addition to 17025 um, are expected to comply with. Uh, this shall include laboratory activities performed in all its permanent facilities, of course, at sites away from its permanent facilities, in associated temporary or mobile facilities, or at the customer's facilities. So uh, again, nothing new here. Just want to uh, emphasize when uh, organization on a scope of accreditation, and I see this quite often with calibration labs, um, they can be accredited, of course, to do a calibration at their fixed facility. And a controlled laboratory environment, everything um, uh, brought into the facility. However, uh, uh, good portion of uh, <clears throat> calibrators may also do uh, calibration on site at the customer's location. That's great for the customers, uh, the downtime um, of their artifacts uh, as far as uh, having them at the lab is of course um, held to a minimum uh, with the lab coming on site to make it convenient for the organization. That is considered a separate accreditation. So. Um, uh, on a scope of accreditation, you'll see subscript under each um, item as an F, an organization is accredited to do it at the fixed facility, or um, an O, they're also accredited to do the, the off-site facility. So with the uh, accreditations done on the off-site facility, uh, the uh, requirements of the standards are expected to be met i.e. and there may be uh, things in that PGLA we're required by ILAC. If you have a calibration that you're accredited to do on your facility, um, that's a calibration we have to witness, but we also, if you also want to claim accreditation to being able to perform that um, calibration or test at the customer's site, uh, we're obligated to also witness that as well. There are, uh, as you, you the, should know if you're doing these offsite calibrations, uh, uh, a little different. Uh, going on the customer's location, you're at the mercy of the customer's environment. Um, you have equipment you're transporting, hopefully being packed securely um, and being transported in a manner to uh, maintain the integrity of their traceable calibrations. Um, oftentimes, uh, have to set up, they have to set up shop right at the customer's location to um, uh, perhaps allow an equilibration period or a warm-up period. So um, again, uh, um, needs to be taken into account both at the fixed facility and the off-site facility. And for those folks that are um, tuned in, and if you're also doing the internal auditing, uh, it would be a good idea that you also audit, not just at the fixed facility, but also at the customer's location just to assure that uh, 
uh, requirements are being met out there, i.e. Um, if the environmentals are out of uh, specifications or, the, or your technician is following the protocol that's, a, that's established in the uh, 17025 uh, standard for those situations, for example. Okay, uh, again, uh, nothing really new here. The laboratory shall define the organization and management structure of the laboratory. Its place in any parent organization and the relationship between management, technical operations, and support services. So I have a uh, uh, depicted here. Uh, typically, this is how I see uh, compliance with this being maintained. Uh, it can, was maintained in 2005. It can be done through a uh, organizational chart that depicts this, and that can be carried forth uh, to 2017. 5.5B, five, five, uh, laboratory shall specify the re somewhere um, um, within the system, um, the laboratory needs to specify uh, individuals and their specific responsibilities, authorities, and their relationships. Um, that can be done uh, as additional verbiage, perhaps in support of the uh, organizational chart. At the, I actually here recently in my um, prepping to do an assessment, uh, saw a very good organizational chart where basically it had detailed um, uh, documentation as far as uh, responsibility authority um, within all the uh, positions that were depicted within that chart. Uh, just uh, bear in mind, however, the lab, uh, however your organization wishes to um, uh, do this, you have options, You're, you, there are flexibility, but somewhere just need to specify these responsibilities, authorities, and interrelationships. One thing I highlighted out there, and um, you may have heard me uh, say this before on previous uh, webinars, affecting the results of laboratory activities. So when the um, standard refers to the personnel, it's um, all personnel. So typically what comes to mind would be the uh, folks that are doing the calibrations for folks that are managing the lab. Um, but uh, it should also indicate as far as responsibilities and authorities, uh, those individuals that do other things not directly related to the test or calibration perhaps. These include, and the two things that always comes to mind uh, would be uh, an individual that's doing internal auditing or any individual who um, has the responsibility for uh, procuring those critical supplies and services that the laboratory uh, need to acquire. Okay, uh, the laboratory, 55C, five, five the laboratory shall document its procedures in a, I bolded that, Hold of this to the extent necessary. So that's different to ensure the consistent application of its laboratory activities and the validity of the results. So uh, typically uh, with, a, with a lab, uh, small labs uh, in particular, um, the processes are typically documented with a quality manual with supporting standard operating procedures, work instructions, um, if you've been doing that in the past and um, it uh, works for you and it fulfills the uh, objective of to the extent necessary and uh, then by all means, um, even though it gives you much more flexibility here, uh, um, you can still utilize uh, the uh, tools from the 2005 and bring them forward. One thing I sort of mentioned there is need access. So typically with a small organization, we have labs at 17025, uh, uh, two, three person labs, um, everything's done in the fixed facility. You think about it, you know, it may be very different for them. Everything could 
basically be documented in a, a hard miner, and that could very well fulfill the um, requirements to the extent necessary. You could have another organization with uh, all multiple technicians, satellite locations, um, where um, basically uh, that uh, may need to be um, branched out a little bit more. So in other words, everybody, when I look at this, uh, would need access to their relevant part of the um, calibration or testing activities and their regular, regular and their um, parts in which they directly uh, need to have in regards to the uh, quality management system. So uh, there's a similar expert excerpt from the uh, actually 2005 standard back in 425. It was required actually that you have your um, documentation structure uh, um, outlined. And it was uh, specifically specified within the uh, quality manual. Have a uh, pyramid down there. So quite often, particularly, uh, uh, I would see this um, requirement uh, being met with uh, associated pyramid, perhaps with the uh, quality manual as a top tier document. Oh, perhaps uh, procedures, work instructions, forms, uh, so forth underneath of that. Again, uh, you can still utilize this uh, pyramid, this type of uh, structure, however, it's not required. Okay, getting specifics here in 5.6, uh, again, the laboratory shall have personnel um, who, irrespective of other responsibilities, have authorities and resources needed to carry out their duties, including, so we're not spelling out any specific personnel as far as a quality manager or technical manager here, but uh, if you, going through here, if you just uh, sort of think about it, I think you'll uh, agree that uh, these typically sound like things that uh, um, you would associate with a quality manager, manual, excuse me, quality manager. Uh, <laughs> Okay, and what's included here, uh, several items, uh, the implementation, maintenance, and improvement of the management system, identification of deviations from the management system, or the um, procedures from performing laboratory activities, initiation of actions to prevent or minimize such deviations. Carrying on over. Uh, D, reporting to laboratory management um, on the performance of the management system and any needs for improvement and ensuring the effectiveness of the laboratory activities. Again, these appear to be duties related to the quality manager. It can be an individual, it can be a team. Uh, it could be several individuals that um, could be uh, different areas of responsibility as far as uh, um, assuring uh, that the 5, 6, A through E is being um, maintained. Again here, uh, nothing new here, uh, communication. So uh, 5, 7, laboratory shall ensure that communication takes place regarding the effectiveness of the management system and the importance of meeting customer and other requirements. So uh, one, uh, one area where this is uh, now required actually um, forces to hand a little bit uh, with the management review. Um, it's actually an output. So uh, um, if anything else, the laboratory is also required under 893, the output sections of the management uh, system of the, excuse me, of the management review, the outputs of the management review shall record all decisions and activities related to at least the effectiveness of the management system and its processes. So just looking at that requirement, again, this is nothing new. This is something that's been assessed. Um, and uh, here, uh, like I said, several different structures within an organization. Uh, often uh, when questioned about this for small organizations, uh, have somebody who is basically the owner, president, uh, go-to person in a small organization, 
open door policy, uh, things that are done very informally. Um, as far as uh, I always uh, felt it was uh, always a good idea to create a record that this being done that is being done. So again, if an, if your organization is having oh say any any type of scheduled meeting, staff meeting, uh, special meeting for any special event, um, I would I always suggest to create a record showing that this has been done i.e. an itinerary, if not, uh, you know, taking actual minutes. So again, uh, uh, very informal, or it could be very formal uh, with someone there actually uh, assigned to perhaps take the minutes and create that record. Five, seven, one, um, B. Nothing new here. The um, from between 2005 2017, the laboratory shall ensure that the integrity of the management system is maintained when one change when changes in the management system are planned and implemented. So, in other words, if anything or ch is changed within the quality management system, uh, you want to be assured that it's not going to perhaps adversely affect or have a direct impact on any other areas within the organization. Typically that's something that's very easy with small organizations uh, when changes are made. With larger organizations, uh, maybe need to be communicated and um, reviewed and uh, assured that uh, and perhaps an impact analysis is done um, before any changes actually does, uh, does occur. Okay, so uh, that's going to conclude uh, um, today's webinar. Um, this time is allocated uh, for questions. Um, so uh, I will pipe down here now. Um, I'm going to go to the uh, question box. So if you haven't, if anything has popped up or uh, now's your opportunity to bring them forth, um, uh, go ahead and type them into the, uh, the bar there and uh, we'll see what we have. Before we move on, in case I uh, forget, I want to go ahead and cover this next slide, which is the next webinar, which is already scheduled for uh, August the 29th. So with uh, the transition, we're well into the transition period between 2005 2017. So if you're unaware, typically those uh, that the accreditation um, with us at PJLA, I can say we, uh, you know, it's coming up, uh, I would say we're not going to uh, assess anymore to the 2005 standard after August 31st of 2020. Um, it's not going to be recognized. We're not going to be able to accredit it to the 2005 after November 30th of 2020. So we we're doing more and more transition assessments. Uh, say uh, when the standard was out the first year, 2018, uh, not so much. Uh, typically, new labs coming on board and make perfectly sense for organizations to get accredited to the 2017. Now we're doing them more and more uh, regular. Regular. Um, I can just even the ones I've been in personally been doing here lately seems like they've been more to the 2017 as opposed to the 2005. So what I'm uh, hoping to do next month is uh, compile data from all of the assessments we've done at Perry Johnson. And uh, we'll see what what areas our assessors are writing findings um, at. And we're going to take a look at that and perhaps develop um, uh, look into those, dissect those areas a little bit further, see where the problems may be undertaken. So let me uh, look at my questions here. Uh, again, I got one here. Um, right now, I know sometimes it takes a while for this uh, uh, question block to uh,
Oh, I got the one. Is a quality manual a requirement to transition training from PJLA indicate otherwise? Not sure what you're referring to there as far as uh, the transition training. Um, you can look at the standard yourself as far as what's required in the 17025 standard. Quality manual is not a requirement. You still have to be able to uh, assure that the, a lot of the um, uh, things which the quality manual was intended to do um, can still take place. I can say uh, currently I, you know, we're talking about we're doing this more and more re with regularity. I've only seen one one organization that actually did away with the quality manual. They've uh, developed an interactive QMS process, which they walked me through. Uh, they were uh, presented it in a manner um, which complied with the standard. They did not have a quality manual. Um, it was not required. But uh, yes, that that is true. The quality manual is not required. Um, however, uh, uh, when I captured that and I go into it more detail if uh, you go back and look at our recordings past webinars um, if it's not I think I may have said uh, when I was looking at that section um, uh, of the standard that, that if it's not fixed uh, excuse me if it's not broke uh, why well, fix it sort of thing and um, I'm finding that most organizations are still utilizing the quality manual um, however, it's not a requirement, and I'm, I'm not sure what training you're referring there to, because if you look through the standards, uh, there is a, not a shall there with a requirement of the quality manual. So um, any other questions, feel free to type, type them in. Uh, I think it was pretty straightforward. The structural requirements, uh, not, not a whole lot of uh, <clears throat> changes, just some more flexibility there. All right, very good. That's, uh, I guess, it's, that's going to be it for, for uh, this month. Um, look forward to everybody signing back on to next month. Uh, it should be interesting. Uh, interested uh, myself to see <laughs> see what, what areas that uh, we're um, finding the most finding in. I'll go ahead and uh, sign off now. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate your participation, and I uh, look forward to seeing everyone else. Uh, Everybody back next month. Thank you.